But without any further ado, uh, please allow me to introduce Alexander Collins, your speaker for this evening, and former uh, Reasoner Project Leverhulme Fellow here at the Wallace Collection. Thank you, Ollie. Um, as Oli just mentioned, I um, worked at the Wallace Collection until recently as the Reason Project uh, Research Fellow. Um, and the Reason Project for you, um, for those of you joining for the first time this evening, um, is a five year long project to find out more about um, the French World Cup maker, Jean Henri Reasoner, um, his career, um, his life um, as um, a court craftsman. Um, and the materials and techniques he used to uh, make his furniture. And this um, was a collaborative project between the Wallace, um, the Wadsden Manor and uh, the Royal Collection, um, who also have um, large collections of um, uh, reason furniture. Um, and so the three institutions have some 30 pieces um, which were um, examined, um, photographed and documented. Um, and all of this um, research fed into the first major monograph on Reasoner, which is now available in our, our shop. Um, and two um, digital uh, platforms, one on the uh, Royal Collection website, um, which is a trail looking at the 30 pieces um, across the three collections, um, the collectors who um, bought them in the 19th century, and the um, digital content which was created as part of the project. So um, exciting interactive uh, 3D models, um, isometric drawings and high resolution images. And there's also a microsite on the Wallace Collection uh, website, which explores some of the themes um, which can be found in the book, um, as well as um, specific digital content relating to the Wallace's objects. Um, and so um, this evening, I would like to um, look at an area of research that came out of my time on the research project, um, which is Reasoner's memoirs. Um, and these memoirs are a sort of diary, as we would maybe expect them to be. They're actually a form of invoice, um, which he submitted to um, the Royal Furniture Administration, the Garde Mer. Um, and um, I would like to look at how Reasoner um, described his furniture, how he you know, the materials and techniques he used um, in his furniture, how he described them, um, and to consider um, how these compare, these details compare to the objects themselves, the details and the evidence which can be found um, on the pieces in the three collections today. Um, and many of these um, discoveries that were made on these pieces of furniture actually came about as part of the physical examinations, um, which um, Jürgen Huber, the um, senior furniture conservator at the Wallace, um, undertook um, uh, on the pieces. Um, and so I would first like to um, introduce um, Reasoner. Um, who we can see here in this portrait dated around 1800 and it was painted by his son Henri Francois Reasoner. And Reasoner, despite being described as one of the greatest French cabinet makers of all time, um, actually um, started his life in Gladbeck in what is now sort of Western Germany. Um, and he was born there in 1734, but by the early to mid 1750s he had emigrated to Paris. Um, which at this time was um, a place which was flourishing under Louis XV um, and had become a, um, a centre of luxury goods production in Europe. And he soon sought um, work in um, the uh, workshop of Jean-Francois Urban, who was another German-born cabinet maker who had been appointed Ebony Stewart, or cabinet maker to the king, uh, to King Louis XV. And in 1760, he had been um, uh, commissioned to create a roll top desk for um, the king's private study at Versailles. Um, but unfortunately, Urban died in 1763, but Reasoner took over the running of the, uh, Urban's workshop and resumed work on the desk, delivering it in 1769. And the desk was an immediate success. It was an incredible piece of furniture and design. Um, and it propelled Reasoner into the French court and into the sort of networks of patronage that existed there um, for a craftsman. Um, and in 1774, he was appointed Ebony Stewart, or cabinet maker to the king, to Louis XVI. Um, and he remained in that position until 11 years later, until 1785, uh, when he was removed um, for uh, uh, charging what was considered exorbitant amounts for his furniture. But in those 11 years, he supplied hundreds of pieces of furniture to the French royal family. 
and many of them um, were described in these um, memoirs, these invoices. And you can see in this slide here um, a header from one of these memoirs dated 1774, and it's formally addressed to um, Pierre Elizabeth de Fontenay, who was um, head of the government of the, the Department of the Royal Household and was responsible for furnishing palaces. And as mentioned earlier, they, they, they served as a form of invoice and they were submitted by royal suppliers. Um, and Riesler's memoirs detail um, the, the dates that various pieces of furniture were commissioned, um, the, um, the clients that they were designed for, so which sort of prince or um, uh, king, uh, queen uh, commissioned them, um, the rooms that they were destined for, um, the various components and materials which make up the piece of furniture, um, and the prices allotted to those. Um, and they have um, quite uh, sort of templated forms um, and uh, the, the language is quite formulaic that is used in them. And um, Lindsay McNaughton in our new um, Reasoner book has explored Reasoner's use of language in his memoirs um, wonderfully. So I would recommend looking at those. Um, and, and these memoirs um, serve as uh, excellent resources for 18th century furniture, furniture historians, as they tell us about Reasoner's uh, production processes, um, the materials and techniques he used in his furniture, the, the prices and values that were allotted to various um, furniture components, um, and, and how workshop labour was divided in the 18th century. They also help us understand how objects have been altered or um, have had um, uh, parts of their uh, sort of uh, structures um, replaced or um, uh, over the centuries. Um, so you will see in um, my following slides that um, I have taken photographs, I've, I've included photographs um, of these memoirs um, and I've also transcribed them, um, but I've carried across the, the original spelling which is um, in the um, archival documents, including misspellings. Um, but the first section I would like to um, look at um, is um, design and how these, um, sort of this relates to Reason's memoirs. Um, and so the uh, objects I would like to look at are these um, corner cupboards, uh, cupboards, which Reasoner made in around 1779-80. Uh, um, and they were delivered to um, what was then Louis XVI's um, private uh, study at Versailles, his cabinet anterior. And they're, they're quite interesting because um, even though they were delivered in, in 1779-80, they're actually of a sort of slightly earlier style, a style of furniture that Reasoner was using from the sort of 1760s to the, 70, the mid 1770s, um, with these sort of lingering um, Rococo sort of curves, and, um, and and they were really designed to integrate into an interior, a pre-existing interior, which was furnished with pre-existing furniture. Um, and so, first of all, I would like to look at the uh, mounts. Um, which are described as having um, a, a frieze um, with a head of Hercules supported by two children, crowned with wreaths in um, oak leaves, and two large consoles and ornamental leaves on both ends which support the corners, um, and having several frames and mouldings surrounding all of the marquetry panels. And these mounts, which are described here, directly echo the mount seen on a chest of drawers, uh, which was in the room at the time. And it's this chest of drawers here. Um, Reasoner supplied this to Louis the Fourteenth, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, in 1774, um, and it was destined for the king's bedroom at Versailles. Um, but by 1779-80, it had moved into the cabinet interior. Um, so you can see from this image that it actually shares with the corner cupboards this um, Hercules frieze with these two sort of. Um, cherubs either side, um, these mouldings um, around the edges of the marquetry and these female console mounds. So first of all, these chest of drawers were referencing, um, sorry, these corner covers were referencing the chest of drawers. And then the, the marquetry uh, panels, which are on the front of the cupboards, um, were described as having um, military attributes. Um, and these um, marquetry panels um, are referencing um, the marked panels which are on the sides of the Bureau de Wa, the king's roll top desk, which I mentioned earlier on, which was started by Urban. Um, and um, this was in the room um, at 
the time of the delivery of the corner cupboards. And the marker tree panels here show um, sort of attributes sort of um, uh, naval and um, land warfare, showing sort of cannons and swords and banners and that sort of thing, um, which we see also in the uh, corner cupboards. Um, and then the final aspect I'd like to look at are the, um, the marble tops which are fitted to the corner cupboards. Um, and Reason describes how they are of Italian griot, and sort of red marble, um, which was matched to the fireplace. And you can see here in this photograph, uh, just peeking out from behind the desk, um, this red marble griot um, chimney piece. Um, and uh, the same marble which is on the corner cupboards. Um, so in these two corner cupboards, Reasoner shows a great degree of design intelligence. Um, he was able to not only de deliver new and exciting forms of furniture, but also to create pieces of furniture which integrated into um, a client's uh, interior. And so here he is referencing um, you know, the architecture of the room, uh, the marquetry of the desk, and the mounts of the chest of drawers. The next aspect I'd like to look at um, are uh, carcasses and the memoirs. Um, so carcasses um, are almost the sort of skeletons of, of furniture um, and um, in reasonless furniture they're often made of oak um, and it's uh, the sort of core to which all of the marquetry and mounts that we see are sort of pinned to so it's an essential um, structure. Um, and Reasoner typically describes in his memoirs um, that the uh, carcasses are made of oak. However, this chest of drawers is a, a notable exception. Um, for, um, it goes one step further, the memoir for this piece, in describing the origin of the oak. Um, so this chest of drawers uh, was made for Louis XV's bedroom in 1775, and it's an incredibly um, grand and lavish piece, and it actually replaced the chest of drawers, which we saw earlier. It's planted it, it was supplied one uh, year earlier. Um, uh, when we look at the uh, memoir, it mentions that the carcass is made of Holland oak. Um, but what, what is Holland oak? Um, André Jacob Rubo, who was a, an 18th century um, cabinet maker and um, author who uh, wrote um, in 1769 The Art of um, de Moinrisier, um, describes uh, Holland oak as being oak which was felled and cut in the Netherlands and then brought to France in varying thicknesses as cortisone planks, making it ideal for furniture making. Um, Cortisone planks um, are, you know, a very desirable um, cut of wood, um, as its, um, its sort of structure is stable enough to not cause um, the sort of warping and, and cracking that you can find in other, other cuts of wood. Um, so he really spared no expense in providing the finest um, quality oak in this royal piece. Um, and what's, what's very interesting is uh, that this seems to be the only piece of furniture which Reasoner describes as having um, a Holland oak carcass. Um, it's not exactly clear why this is the only piece which is described as such, um, but it may have been that in his early years as, as a royal cabinet maker, 1775, the year after he was appointed, he was keen to um, impress his royal patrons and so wrote um, at length and described every uh, you know, in, in describing um, every part and component of the piece and its sort of origins in order to justify the high prices that he was charging for them. Or it may be that he used um, the best um, sort of quality imported oak that was available to him at the time to create um, this sort of royal masterpiece. The next uh, uh, the, sorry, the, um, in, in contrast to this, um, a year later, um, this chest of drawers was delivered to the Comtesse de Revanche, Louis XVI's um, sister-in-law, um, uh, Versailles in, uh, in 1776. Uh, and this, um, interestingly, um, has a memoir which doesn't describe um, the, the material used in the carcass. Um, though the, when it was ordered, um, it uh, was described as um, Reasoner was instructed to work very diligently and to, uh, to, um, to supply it um, in a short space of time to, um, to fulfill the, the requirements of the um, princess. Um, and uh, when you um, in sort of look at the carcass itself today, um, you can see that um, 
Wiesner um, had to you know, create a piece of furniture in a relatively short period of time, um, as you have these sort of splits and cracks which have had historic repairs carried out on them. Um, and this would have been um, caused by using um, uh, sort of uh, wood which wasn't seasoned um, for a particularly long period of time, meaning that it, the moisture content in it uh, altered over a period of time and, and causing this sort of cracking and splitting. And in fact, he delivered it in less than 50, in, in 50 days, meaning that he would have had to use whatever sort of oak was available to him at the time. Uh, and then the final uh, piece I'd like to look at in this section is the uh, jewel cabinet, which is really one of Reason's greatest masterpieces. And it was delivered to uh, the Comtesse de Perrance again in 1787, but to her bedroom at Versailles. And it's an incredible piece and it's ambitious in its size, its form, and, and the sheer sort of weight of its decoration. And this presented many um, challenges to um, Reasoner. Um, in particular, uh, his greatest consideration was the weight. And he mentioned uh, the steps that he took to reduce the weight um, uh, in the memoir and, and the steps that he uh, took to reinforce it against this weight. Um, and uh, one of these things which is described in the memoir is these loose tongue joints. Um, so you can see um, in the carcass here that um, the, uh, the carcass is made up of multiple oak boards. And between these boards are these sort of separate um, pieces of wood which have been inserted along their length. So you have two boards and a smaller piece of wood inserted between them. And this increases the surface area of the carcass and, and sort of reinforces it against this weight. You can also see it um, in the stretches between the legs. So you have here um, four pieces of wood um, which um, then have these small sort of slithers inserted between them. Um, and this um, appears to be the only time that Reasoner used this in his cabinet making career. It hasn't been found on any other Reasoner pieces yet. Um, and so it shows his ability to um, you know, not only maintain sort of streamlined production processes and to really um, figure out the you know, sort of easiest way to produce something, but also to think creatively around problems um, so that he can deliver furniture, which impressed his royal uh, patrons. And the next section I would like to look at in um, regards to the memoirs is uh, trellis marquetry. Uh, so Reasoner was renowned for creating trellis marquetry in his furniture. It was particularly associated with um, the French royal family, uh, the furniture that was created for them, and Marie Antoinette. And you can see it um, just here in these panels. And it shows uh, a sort of fretwork interspersed with uh, sunflowers. And it's an incredibly uh, complex creation and it's made of uh, multiple types of uh, dyed and naturally colored woods, wood, which Reasoner would have sort of uh, assembled in a, almost like a jigsaw-like pattern. And he describes uh, the uh, materials and the sort of design of this trellis marquetry um, in quite some depth in his memoirs. Um, the first piece I'd like to look at is this chest of drawers again, which was made for Louis XVI's bedroom. Um, and in the memoir, he describes how he's um, executed four mosaic trellis uh, panels of quantities of satin egg compartments with white and black fillets following the shadows of a painting, garnished with yellow buttons in the oval parts and quantities of sunflowers in the parts in diamond shape, um, cut out, shaded and inlaid in a grey satin background. And we can see this um, in the existing uh, marquetry today. Um, so these sort of uh, this fretwork which um, spans across the panels would have been what is made from satin but it's a redder colour. Um, these oval parts would have been a sort of yellow colour. Um, the grounds um, of these diamond shapes would have been a silvery grey, that satin hair grey that he talks about. The flowers as a reddy orangey colour um, and then these um, fillets or what we call stringing um, around the edges of these lozenges um, uh, are sort of shadowed. So um, you, you see here that they're, they're white at the bottom and then darker at the top and they would have been much darker originally. And this gives it a sense of shadow depth and a sense of realism. Um, and I think that's what he's trying to describe in his, his memoirs that it's sort of 
um, you know, it's giving the effect, uh, the, the sense of realism that you get from painting and that this is like painting in wood. And he describes um, a similar uh, sort of marquetry creation on this chest of drawers made for the Comtesse de Provence in 1776. Um, and he says that the marquetry is composed of five panels, four of which are in very elaborate mosaic and quantities of compartments cut out of satinet wood with white and black fillets, posed according to the shadows of the painting, garnished with a yellow button in the oval parts and of sunflowers in the diamond shaped parts. And you can see a similar arrangement, but this, uh, this time in sort of more geometric form, the trellises are much larger. And this really sort of demonstrates how Reisner was able to create um, sort of different styles of trellis marquetry uh, and, and, and different styles more generally in his furniture using uh, the sort of same materials um, which he's created on previous uh, pieces of furniture. So he was able to sort of streamline his production but uh, was able to um, sort of alter and uh, sort of ever so slightly change these pieces in order to make each one unique for his uh, royal clients. Uh, we see a similar type of trellis marquetry on this uh, writing table, which was made for Louis XVI at the Petit Triennial in 1777. Um, and Reasoner describes how um, the top of the table is veneered in mosaic, many compartments cut in satinet with white and black fillets, placed following the shadows of a painting, garnished with rosettes of yellow wood in the shape of sunflowers. And again, you see. The, the same sort of trellis arrangement that we saw in the chest of drawers. Uh, and then the final pieces I'd like to look at in this uh, section are these two corner cupboards, um, which made reason made for the King's study at Versailles. Um, and he describes here how he has made mosaic panels in satinet with many compartments in the form of um, lozenges surrounded with white and black fillets and garnished with yellow rosettes and barbary root inlaid in a gray satin background. So you see this recurring um, sort of language and recurring um, materials in his trellis marquetry, but they're sort of differing design um, throughout the years. And I'd like to take a little look at the stringing again. So the stringing was that, that sort of what he described, reason described, as the black and white fillets surrounding the lozenges. Um, and I'd like to look at the stringing on this chest of drawers, which we saw earlier, which was made for Louis XVI's bedroom in 1774. Um, and he describes how the stringing surrounding the lozenges is uh, are simply black and white fillets. There's no mention of the materials um, used to make them. And you can see here, um, the uh, stringing as it appears today. Um, and, and traditionally in, in furniture history, um, stringing uh, in reason furniture has often been described as being, uh, or the black stringing is described as being uh, made of ebony. But um, this photograph shows here that the, the, the black wood actually doesn't really appear like ebony. It doesn't have that same density and structure. And it, it almost looks like a, a lighter wood, which has been um, dyed um, uh, sort of with a black sort of stain, making it ebonized, so in a, in sort of imitating ebony. Um, and you know, this is particularly clear when you compare it with other pieces of stringing on Reason Furniture. So this four from desk made for Marie Antoinette in 1780 um, shows um, pieces of string which could indeed be ebony. So they're, they're much darker and denser than the, um, the string which we see on the chest of drawers here. But this sort of ebonized, imitated ebony um, is, is found across um, much of Reason's furniture. So we can see it um, on the chest of drawers made for Louis XVI in 1775, um, the two corner cupboards made for Louis XVI, um, the chest of drawers made for the Comtesse de Provence, a forefront desk made for Louis XVI in 1777, and um, the writing table made the same year for the king. Um, so it appears that Reasoner did use what seemed to be lengths of ebony in his stringing, but also lengths of what seemed to be a paler, sort of almost fruit wood, dyed um, black. Um, so it seemed, it's almost that he is describing the colour and the effect that the stringing is giving, not the materials that it's made from. He used what was ever, whatever was available to him. Um, 
But how did he create this ebonized string? Um, the Dictionary of Arts and Crafts, which was published in um, 1766, um, may shed a little bit more light on this. I'm very grateful to um, Helen Jacobson for um, this uh, amazing reference. Um, this section here, we can see um, that um, it's describing how ebonists uh, take uh, pearwood, a, a pale sort of fruitwood, um, and dye it black with a hot mixture of gallnut, which is a sort of growth which trees develop um, when they're attacked by parasitic insects and is quite rich in tannins, um, and writing ink. And that they, they apply this uh, sort of mixture um, to wood um, and then apply hot wax over it. So we don't know if this is exactly what Reasoner was using to create his ebonized stream, um, but it's very likely that he'd used a similar process. And Reasoner's furniture, apart from the trellis marquetry, um, is, is really famous for um, the quality of its um, gilt bronze mounts, which are so beautifully modelled, chased and gilded, and they have a great sculptural quality about them. Um, and, uh, and particularly this chest of drawers has these incredible um, figures and garlands of fruit and flowers and the head of Apollo in the center. Um, it's, they are really beautiful works themselves. And the memoir for this, uh, for Louis XVI's chest of drawers, um, describes how um, these uh, gilt bronze mounts were made. And we're quite lucky with this memoir that uh, it records in such detail how they were um, created. And um, he doesn't go, always go into such detail in his memoirs. This is um, quite unusual. Um, and so he describes how, um, here's a, tra a transcription, how um, he has have had he has had all the ornaments, figures, garlands, trophies, bas reliefs, mouldings, palms, flowers, sun, uh, suns, and other wax uh, and others wax modelled, and having had the largest parts of what can be called architecture carved out of wood, having placed it and fixed in place as the thing should be to ensure the pleasant shape, to have corrected several faults which have appeared, and then having had the plaster cast of the said um, waxes. Um, uh, pulled them out of weight and having melted all of the um, flowers in brass um, and then having um, the, all of the said models in brass weighing more than 350 pounds and then having all of the aforesaid castings, figures, mouldings, flowers and ornaments sculpted and sawn and filed and having employed for a year a number of chiseler workers to repair the said works all were made and adjust, uh, fitted with the greatest precision and with all possible care. And so what this really shows is the extensive um, processes which were involved in creating these um, uh, gilt bronze mounts and how he had to employ for a year um, specialised bronze workers to create them. So he really didn't spare any expense or effort in creating a real masterpiece for the king. He was very eager to impress in his early years of his career. Um, and also because of the um, very strict um, guild regulations in Paris in the 18th century, um, cabinet makers only in, you know, in exceptional, uh, in exceptional uh, circumstances uh, were not um, allowed to create mounts, um, so they had to be outsourced to specialised um, bronze workers, and this is what's happened here. Um, and it's also interesting that he um, mentioned that they were fitted with the greatest precision and with all possible care. Um, and, and what does he really mean by that? Um, well, the memoir uh, for this forefront desk, which was made for uh, the Louis XVI at uh, Petit Trianon in 1777, mentions that the mounts were fitted with nuts and bolts um, so that they aren't apparent. Um, and what he's talking about um, can be seen on the mounts today. So you can see that um, they have soldered to the back of the mounts um, these sort of, uh, threaded bolts and then at the top you have these notched nuts and these bolts would pass through holes um, in the carcass, so for example the freeze drawer here, and then they would be um, tightened with the notched um, uh, nuts. So you wouldn't be able to see um, any fittings from the outside, they look um, the designs are completely um, uh, uh, disrupted and um, you can only see the, the fixings from the insides of the, uh, the carcass. Um, and this is almost 
uh, sort of trademark of Reason's production you see it across nearly all of his furniture um, for example you see um, a similar design on these uh, corner cupboards here which were made for Louis XVI's private study um, and they a uh, the memoir for these describes again this nut and bolt design um, which um, isn't apparent, isn't visible to the onlooker. And you can see again, these notched, these quite distinctive notched um, nuts and these threaded bolts. Um, and these sort of um, nuts and bolts come in all sorts of um, sort of arrangements. Sometimes um, the, uh, the threaded bolts are longer, um, sometimes they're shorter, sometimes they're made of you know, brass, sometimes other materials. Um, and sometimes the bolts are soldered to the nuts and they screw into the back of mounts. Um, so they all um, differ in, in sort of execution, but the concept behind them is, is the same. Um, and, and these variations should really be considered in light of, you know, sort of workshop, um, the availability of materials in workshops and the availability of, of labor and also time restraints. And I would just like to return to the jewel cabinet for a moment to consider the incredible mounts which um, feature on it. Um, and it's absolutely sort of dripping in um, gilt bronze. And this is a considerable weight. And we know from the carcass, uh, the description of the carcass in the memoir um, that I was talking about earlier on, that he really, Reasoner, really um, uh, suffered. Um, from uh, you know having to reinforce a carcass against the, the the weight of these mounts, but he also sought measures in the mounts themselves to reduce their weight and to make them um, sort of um, uh, for them to retain their um, their beauty and their sculptural quality without um, causing the piece to collapse. And he describes how he did this in his memoir. Um, which unfortunately I don't have a picture of, um, but I can uh, read you an extract. Um, he mentions that he um, has modelled on the case all the various ornaments and figures of which it is adorned in wax as well as clay, um, um, and as well as the flowers and garlands and clouds having been sculpted in wood, all the models of mouldings as well as the vases and cassolettes. Um, and to have moulded in plaster the figures and the cresting, and to have had them repaired before getting cast in brass to have them lighter. And to have had cast in brass all the said models of which several in lost wax, two figures and the children on a plaster core, the same as the clouds and the vases to reduce the weight. And having had soldered all the said pieces that could not be cast more than a foot long, have had frames made each one along its length and bent each piece according to its form and soldered the arms and legs to figures and children which were separated and welded all the screws and nuts to everything inside which didn't appear to be solid. Um, so what he did to reduce the weight of the mounts was to hollow them out and to um, uh, place um, them on sort of plaster cores. Um, so that way you still get the sort of beautiful um, sculptural quality of them, but they're sort of hollow and much lighter and don't, um, don't affect the stability of the carcass. Um, so it shows Reasoner uh, maintaining a certain degree of flexibility. He um, had his, his work processes and the, and the typical um, methods that he used to create his mounts, but sometimes the, the ambition of these pieces um, required him to sort of go off piste in his, in his design and his methods and to ex experiment um, with ways of, of achieving his very um, lavish um, designs. Um, and being, you know, this is uh, some, some two years after he was removed from his position as heir of Ebony Stoire. And so he was surely um, eager to impress on this, this sort of commission, this important royal commission that he had received um, from the Comtesse de Provence. Um, and um, interestingly, um, at the end of his description of the mounts, he mentions how um, the um, nut and bolt fixings, which are on the backs of the mounts, um, are veneered um, uh, with the hot mahogany. Um, so the fixings weren't visible from the outside, but um, on the inside they were, they were invisible too. So they were sort of the actual nuts and bolts were completely covered in this beautiful mahogany veneer. Um, and the last aspect I'd like to look at um, is uh, Reasons and Mechanics um, and his memoirs. 
Um, so reason of furniture is uh, often features the mechanical aspect. Um, and this is perhaps a debt to his master Urban, who was renowned for creating uh, mechanical, multifunctional pieces of furniture, which really catered to the, to the latest in, in 18th century comfort. And Reasoner often included mechanical aspects in his furniture to ease their use and to make them um, more um, sort of user friendly. Um, and so to return to this chest of drawers, um, one thing we notice about it is its incredible size and the drawers, the main drawers here, which we can see in the center are incredibly deep and incredibly wide and they're quite difficult to remove. They're quite heavy and awkward. Um, and so Reasoner was aware of this. And in his memoir, he mentions how um, the two main drawers have been fitted with brass rollers. Um, so this would have allowed the, um, the drawers to move in and out of the carcass uh, with, with ease. Um, and interestingly, these survive, or these sort of rollers that he um, designed for his furniture survive on this chest of drawers made for the Comtesse de Provence. And you can see them here. Um, they're sort of a bracket and then small rollers fitted to the rear edges of the drawers um, so that they can um, roll in and out. And this is, you know, really reasoner showing his, ability, his intelligence as a designer and thinking about how his furniture would be used, um, not only how it would decorate a room and how people would interact with it. Um, but this sort of design feature only appears in, or seems to only appear in his early furniture. It doesn't appear in his later furniture. And we're not quite sure why that is. It could be that they were too costly or complicated to produce. And in order to sort of um, refine his, his manufacturing processes, he felt that it was easier to remove them from the process and that he would just um, construct the drawers without them. But he also um, fitted um, quite complicated hinge and counterbalance mechanisms to his forefront desks. And I'd like to look at this example in particular, the Louis XVI's um, forefront desk. Um, and the memoir for this desk describes how um, its forefront has been fitted with uh, counterbalances to make the opening of it um, more pleasant. And you can um, see this in this sort of counterbalance that he's talking about in the carcass today. So this is the, the piece viewed from the back, the, the, the back or the back of the piece has been uh, removed and you're looking into the, um, into the carcass um, through to the front and you can see the forefront here um, in the folded position. And these are the various drawers, uh, drawer and pigeonhole compartments. And these um, counterbalances, which are sort of um, curved pieces, um, exist in the sort of uh, sides of the carcasses, uh, at the sides of the inner cabinets, and they are connected to um, the hinges that run down the edges of the forefronts. Um, and they uh, control the movement of the forefront, so they allow it to sort of drop um, in a controlled way and for it to rise in a, a controlled way so you're not in danger of catching your fingers or for the uh, forefront to um, slam down and, and um, snap off its um, hinges. Um, and what's um, particularly remarkable about these um, counter balance and uh, hinge mechanisms is that um, they demonstrate how Reasoner um, had knew exactly where to focus his, uh, his efforts um, to greatest effect. So the hinges that run down the sides of the um, forefronts are visible to the onlooker and they're very refined and very polished but the counterbalances to which they're attached, these sections here, these weights, are quite crude but they're, they're perfectly um, functional. Um, so he knew that you know, knew where to spend his time making his furniture, those bits that weren't visible, um, just like these sides of the carcasses here, as well as the, the actual um, uh, 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 mechanical parts, um, are left quite unrefined and unpolished, um, but uh, the, the user will be totally unaware. And I would just like to, um, in conclusion, um, think about how these case studies have um, 
shown Reasoner's versatility as a cabinet maker and designer um, and to show how he um, really um, experimented with his materials and techniques um, and his designs but once he uh, found a sort of winning for formula he really stuck with it and uh, you know, refined it further but also um, sort of uh, you know adapted it for um, this, the purposes of novelty and to suit the tastes of his clients um, and I also hope that it's um, demonstrated the benefits of combining um, object and archival based study this has been a particularly um, fruitful methodology for the Reasoner project um, and has thrown up many tantalizing leads which have fed into the uh, the Reasoner book and also the digital content and online platforms. And it, the memoirs also um, it reveal much about the history of the objects um, in the three collections and um, how they've been manufactured um, as well as their alterations and changing tastes which they have been subject to um, across the centuries. Uh, I'd now like to um, ask if there are any questions. Well, thank you so much Alex, that was a, a fantastic talk and such an insight as well into uh, into the world of reason. I apologize, I must apologize, I uh, referred to him as French earlier which I think uh, must be a bit of a bit of a faux pas on my, on my part but we do have questions already in um, so I'm going to jump into those straight away if that's okay. So first of all, we have one here. Uh, with reference to the description of Holland Oak, was there a requirement for the use of materials, sorry, rather, uh, to use materials exclusively for the king in contrast uh, to materials that would be available to other members of the royal entourage? Um, I don't think that the, the Gardner, when the sort of Royal Furniture Administration, when ordering furniture really stipulated the materials, in particular the sort of carcass materials that were, were needed in the furniture, I think they left that to the cabinet maker to decide. But Reasoner in his early career, and I think throughout his whole career as a royal cabinet maker, was very eager to impress and did supply, uh, you know, masterpieces to the royal household. Um, and I think he used the best materials that he had available to him whether they be exported, imported, um, and he would have been in contact with all sorts of, um, you know, timber merchants and merchant, you know, marble merchants and all, all of the different people who would have supplied him with materials. Um, but he also would have known where to, not sort of cut corners, but where he was able to use uh, a slightly inferior product, you know, where it wouldn't compromise um, the structural or aesthetic integrity of a piece. Um, so I think he was a very intelligent cabinet maker and he knew what to use and to what effect. Certainly. Uh, while we're on the topic of, uh, of materials, <clears throat> excuse me, I have another question here, uh, which I believe you may have mentioned. Uh, did he use ebony in his pieces? I think you mentioned earlier there was some small pieces of ebony. Um, yeah, it seems like he did use some ebony in his marketry. Um, and so he, it looks like he used what appears to be ebony in some of the stringing of his furniture um, but sometimes it, it, it appears to be um, ebonized so I think he used whatever again what whatever was really available to him and would achieve the effect that he was looking for I don't know if he was necessarily uh, you know sort of set on using ebony I think it was a, a, a sort of a case of what he could be supplied with and again on materials here just before we move on to uh, some slightly different questions. Um, we have a question here. Uh, where did the wood come from and how many different types were used in all? I appreciate this might be quite a big question. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so he would have used um, uh, hundreds of types of different you know, woods and uh, you know, dyed and naturally coloured um, and um, he uh, would have sourced these from you know, all sorts of uh, timber merchants and um, you know, these were brought from across um, the world, across trading routes. So, you know, so for example, um, you know, mahogany could come from South America, you know, oak could come from Europe. So it was really um, uh, a sort of a geographical, uh, a sort of an international enterprise. Um, and, you know, with various um, uh, sort of uh, wars and uh, embargoes, um, over the 18th century, the, the available and the closing of trade routes, um, the availability of different types of woods did 
change over time. Um, uh, so we, that, you know, for example, we find that um, mahogany uh, furniture, even though it was quite popular in, in the 18th century in England, um, it wasn't until the later 18th part of the 18th century that it became popular in France, and that was because of uh, um, an increase in supply and a sort of uh, taste for all things English. Fantastic. Um, another question here. Uh, which cabinet maker replaced Riesner in 1785? I'm not sure if you know that one. Um, so the successor to uh, Fontenier, who we mentioned earlier, the head of the Gardner, um, the Thierry de Vildebreg, um, he appointed um, Benman, Guillaume Benman, who was another German-born cabinet maker to uh, sort of a supply piece of furniture that Wilhelm sold and repair uh, pre-existing pieces and he even repaired a piece of Reasoner's furniture um, which uh, was a forefront desk which Reasoner made for Marie Antoinette in 1780. And uh, another question here, <clears throat> perhaps relating to what you were saying earlier about sort of geopolitics of the period, um, mm. what was Reasoner's life like during the revolution? Was he ever in danger? Um, I'm sure there um, was a degree of danger um, being a royal cabinet maker. Um, he, Created some, you know, very uh, lavish pieces of furniture, um, you know, sort of uh, covered in beautiful marquetry and um, very lavish gilt bronze uh, mounts. Um, and he had become um, relatively wealthy, and he sort of um, become increasingly bourgeois um, over his career. Um, but he was, um, I guess lucky in that he didn't, um, he wasn't imprisoned and he wasn't executed. He did survive until 1806. Um, he did try his hand at buying some back, some of his own furniture um, during revolutionary sales, which didn't go too well. Um, and then he, in his later career, he tried his hand at property investment and sort of financial speculations. Um, none of them were, you know, really any great success, but um, he, he died relatively comfortably in, in 1806. And uh, another one here, uh, did Oban and Riesner come from an existing German tradition of luxury furniture making? Um, that's a very good question. Um, Riesner um, himself, um, as far as I'm aware, didn't come from a, uh, a camp making family, really. His, fa his father was a, a sort of um, a local official in his town. Um, so he, he didn't learn a camp making trade from his father, as far as we know. Um, um, but I think that um, the Urban and Reasoner really in their cabinet making brought a mechanical aspect to French furniture. So I think um, German furniture, you know, for example, cabinet makers like Röntgen um, are renowned for creating these almost sort of um, the furniture that's almost like a machine, you know, with various um, sort of uh, doors and compartments which open with the turn of a key. So I think that they were very good at integrating mechanical aspects into furniture. Um, I think that was a tradition that they brought with them. Fantastic. Uh, we have another one here. Uh, when did the furniture enter, the, sorry, rather, when did Reasoner's furniture enter the uh, British Royal Collection? Um, so most of the furniture entered the collection of George IV um, in 1825. And most of it, well, it came from um, uh, another sort of great 19th century collector called George Watson Taylor. Um, and he had collected this uh, sort of uh, magnificent assembly of reason furniture um, and then his furniture was sold at um, Christie's along with the rest of his collection and um, George IV snapped it up um, and it's uh, it's been in their whole collection ever since. And who can blame them really? Uh, so I'm going to take a few questions now from the chat. Uh, we'll be flipping back to the uh, Q&A section as well. We have a lot of questions coming in Alex so which is uh, always nice to see. Uh, so we have a question here. Uh, in the jewel cabinet, uh, what is the material reasoner used for the vase decorations besides bronze? Um, that's a very good question. I think it's um, he used uh, mostly um, brass um, in his uh, in the vases in the mounts generally, um, and um, the um, sort of blue um, material which you see on them is a sort of like an enamel type material. 
Um, and so those are the main materials used to make them. Mm -hmm. And another question from the, uh, from the same viewer there. Uh, how many people worked under Reason Only's workshop? Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's not an awful lot of archival material about his workshop and how he ran it. Um, so we have to take what we can glean from the memoirs and uh, other sort of documents that he's left behind. But given his sort of quite prolific output, um, I'm sure that he ran quite a large workshop. Um, and he probably also subcontracted a lot um, and outsourced various uh, components to different craftsmen. Fantastic. And uh, another question here, if you, if you don't mind, there a lot of questions, <laughs> as I said. Uh, so since Reason's workshop uh, was at the protective enclave of the arsenal, could his team have forged mechanical parts uh, or cast some of the mounts, or were they subcontracted out and produced elsewhere? Um, I'm sure that he um, subcontracted a lot of his mounts, um, as he mentioned in his uh, memoir for um, the chest of drawers made for Louis the 16th in 1775, and that he employed um, uh, bronze workers to create these things. Um, so I imagine that he found the best sort of uh, bronze workers and labour available to him to make these pieces. Fantastic. And uh, of the 700 pieces that Reasoner made, uh, do we know how many survive? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Um, they are, I mean, there are pieces of Reasoner, uh, Royal Reasoner furniture across uh, museums and private collections uh, um, in sort of, well, across the world. Um, and 30 are in the three collections which have been part of the Reasoner project. Um, but um, I can't give you an exact figure, unfortunately. Um, but um, lots of museums, so for example, like the Met and the V&A, the Getty, all, you know, all have um, important reason pieces. Hard to keep track, I think, with, the, yeah. with so many pieces <laughs> being out there. Yeah. So another one here, coming back to uh, materials and marquetry. Uh, uh, could you say more about the pale wood in the stringing of trellis marquetry? Is it, is it Hollywood, for example? Um, I don't think we know specifically. It's traditionally been described as box, um, but, um, and that could be the case, but we, we don't know specifically. We haven't um, ident done any sort of scientific identification on that. Thank you. And another one here. Uh, the term repairier exists not only in metalwork, uh, but also in the 18th century porcelain factories. Does it mean finisher? Yes, yes, I, I, that's what it means. Yes, it's not sort of repairing the piece physically, but it's sort of um, chasing and filing and then sort of preparing the surface. Apologies, I'm, I've most likely butchered that, so <laughs> but that was understandable there. Uh, another question here, uh, has Reasoner left any other written documents uh, or are the memoir, oh sorry, rather, or are the memoirs the only one available? Um, there are, I mean, um, there's not a great deal um, of material from him. Um, there are obviously reference, references to him in other Gardner material, um, and there are the sort of archival references to him, but there's not a great deal, um, if, if anything at all, in his, in his hand that I know of. Thank you. Uh, another one here, again, apologies for my pronunciation, but uh, did he know uh, Root? Rontengen's uh, mechanical <laughs> furniture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, mechanical furniture, and would he have considered it as a competition? Um, I'm, I'm sure he was very aware of Rontgen. Um, I mean, he supplied um, pieces of furniture to um, Marie Antoinette, who was one of his, you know, uh, greatest clients. Um, so I'm fully, I'm, I'm sure he was fully aware of him and his furniture and the, the competition he presented. Certainly someone for me to, uh, to look into there a little bit. Uh, another question here. Uh, since Reasoner's workshop uh, was at the uh, protective enclave, oh, I'm afraid we've already answered that one, uh, so we'll pop ahead. Uh, considering that he used many types of wood that expand and retract differently uh, in different moisture and heat conditions, uh, how did he keep the woods together? Is there anything in his notes? And I imagine this is a, a challenge for uh, people such as yourself and Jürgen, uh, even now. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so he didn't mention any, uh, he hasn't mentioned anything specifically in the, his, his uh, notes or memoirs that we have come across. Um, but um, he would have understood the materials that he was using, like, you know, the sort of natural qualities and how they react to different moisture contents. And so would have the uh, marketers and other carbon makers that worked in his workshops. Um, and so he would have known the best practices to, um, you know, to, to use these uh, materials effectively. Thank you very much. And another one uh, here, just our, our last few now. Um, where was the workshop based? And was there an apprentice, uh, apprenticeship or, or master's scheme uh, in France at the time? Um, so his workshop um, was based at um, the Arsenal in, in Paris. Um, so that was, it used to be a military complex um, in the uh, sort of eastern part of uh, France, uh, Paris, sorry, uh, not too far um, from the uh, Bastille. Um, and um, he had um, a whole sort of uh, workshop uh, complex there. Um, and uh, there was an apprentice uh, sort of scheme in France and it was in Paris it was it was regulated by uh, a guild and you would have had to have carried out an apprenticeship and then become a sort of journeyman and then sort of graduated as a master after submitting a masterpiece um, and paying guild fees um, so it was a very regulated craft um, and it was um, the guilds were managed by the cabinet makers themselves um so it was and in paris it was particularly strict there was a very strict specialization of trades thank you uh, another question here uh did the i'd uh, rather did he alter the mounts for every piece um there are similar pieces but not exact copies on other uh, desks and commodes at the wallace collection for example uh were those was it something that he would alter every time um, I think he um, strove to make every piece that he delivered, particularly to his royal clients, um, unique. Um, and we tend to think that a lot of his designs for um, particular floral mounts and things like that are all the same. But actually, when you look at them and you compare them, and this is something that we've been doing um, over the course of the Reason Project, you realise that there are lots of subtle differences so they're not exactly the same they're slightly different shapes and sizes um, and so he was very clever in how he did that and I'm sure that he took into account the tastes and sort of interests of his clients when making these mounts and so you know we have um, on Marie Antoinette's furniture uh, furniture is decorated with you know beautiful trellis marketry and and floral mounts um, which sort of reflected her interest and tastes in, in, in flowers and gardens and uh, you know sort of um, uh, you know, and in, in how it's in, and incorporated into in, in her interiors. Thank you very much. Uh, another question on the mounts. Uh, did Reasoner design the gilt bronze mounts or was this uh, done by the bronziers that he employed? Um, I'm sure he was involved in some of the mount designing processes and his um, portrait um, from 1786 shows him um, at a desk designing, making sketches for mounts. Um, so I'm sure he had a hand in it, but he also collaborated with other um, craftsmen, um, bronze workers, um, such as Etienne Martin Corsa, who created quite a lot of Reasoner's mounts. Um, and so I'm sure it was a collaborative effort between um, Reasoner um, and the bronze worker and he sort of had the overall scheme and design in his head and sort of really showed the bronze worker what he wanted. Thank you very much and uh, I'll take another question from the chat now. Um, what about Reason's drawings? Are there any exhibited anywhere? Um, not that we know of, unfortunately we haven't found any. <laughs> one, one to keep an eye out for perhaps. <laughs> uh, we have another question here, our last few now. Uh, do we know more about the uh, Lelo? Uh, again, apologies for the pronunciation. Uh, reason of difficulties after Oben's death. Um, the relationship between Lelo and Reasoner is um, covered in quite some detail in our Reasoner book, um, and um, there are um, you know some really interesting um, encounters between the two of them. Um, you know between like you know 
for example, public disagreements in the street and that sort of thing. Um, and so Christine Borles has done a wonderful job of um, charting Reasoner's early career in our book. So I would recommend reading that. Thank you very much. And just the last few, as I mentioned, uh, could the blackened pieces, I uh, believe, which were uh, attempt to um, emanate ebony, as we discussed earlier, uh, could the blackened pieces be produced uh, with hot sand? Um, so Reasoner did use hot sand, or we think that he used hot sand to create um, shading in a lot of his pictorial marketry. Um, so, for example, um, you know, if you have um, uh, sort of a flower um, in a design and you have the sort of the shape of a shadow beneath it, that would have been created by placing um, pieces of marquetry in hot sand for a short while to sort of darken and blacken um, to give this sort of realistic shadow effect. Um, but whether he used it to create this sort of black stringing, I'm not sure. It looks like it's been stained. Thank you so much. Uh, we did have one more question, but I believe that's regarding uh, different types of wood, which we have discussed already. Uh, but I would like to say, of course, a huge thank you to Alex uh, this evening. It's been a wonderful talk and a brilliant session of uh, uh, answering questions as well. Uh, we are um, aiming to make sure that all of our Reasoner talks will soon be available on our YouTube channel, uh, on our Wallace Collection uh, YouTube channel. So do keep an eye out for them uh, popping up there if you've uh, missed anything or if you'd like to uh, to pop back and watch anything again. Uh, it's been fantastic to uh, to listen along today. And uh, of course, I hope that everybody watching along at home um, will be able to come and visit with us uh, soon, perhaps uh, not in the immediate future, but once uh, once restrictions are, are a bit more open, uh, to come and view our, our Reasoner display um, across uh, a number of the galleries at the Wallace Collection. And of course, I hope that you all enjoyed this evening's talk. So finally, just once again, thank you, Alex. And of course, thank you to everybody uh, at home. And hope to see you soon. <laughs>